Hello, I'm Daniela from MDPI Marketing Team, and today I'm interviewing Artemis P. Simpolos, who is well known for her research in polyunsaturated omega-3 fatty acids, and especially the omega-6 slash omega-3 balance. She has authored many popular books on diet and nutrition, including The Omega Diet. Today, we'll be talking to her about her newest MDPI book release, The Healthiest Diets for You, Scientific Aspects. Firstly, I would like to say thank you so much for being here today and to talk to us about your book. I'm so, very pleased to have the interview with you. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, I would say the most important concept that is in the book, and I think it makes the book unique, is the fact that uh, nutrition is not only the most important environmental factor, but it contributes to health through the interaction with our genetics and our metabolism. And this is a concept that is the basis for personalized nutrition, which is, of course, the new way of looking at nutrition. In the book, we put a great deal of emphasis on the scientific evidence on the importance of nutrition for health. And the reason we put all that emphasis is because uh, a person can make changes in their lives, provided they understand what these changes are going to be and what they're going to contribute. And this is the only book where it takes into consideration the scientific aspects, as well as the interaction of nutrients, genes, and the environment, and usually, when people have enough knowledge, they do make changes. And I expect them to change uh, their diet as well as improve their physical activity. And this is, this is a book for health. And it's not based on recipes, but on concepts and scientific concepts that are easy to understand and therefore can be interpreted by the reader and make the appropriate changes. And in the last chapter of the book, we really provide specific recommendations and changes that need to be made. Yes, absolutely. What I found interesting was that you had a list of, not, it's not recipes, but ingredients that you think are obviously important to have in your diet. And I thought that was really interesting because it doesn't mean that you have to go out and change all your recipe ideas. It's just what you have in your cupboards, which is really, which is quite easy to do, I think, for everybody. Yes. Um, this, this is uh, a book that provides the scientific information that leads to understanding and the reasons why you need to make changes. And you can use your own recipes, but you have to make changes in the selection of the oils, the type of meat, the type of drinks, the type of eggs, and this is the, the important concepts. It's not really the recipes, it's how you substitute what is very important for health from the routine advertisements of the marketing. Well, I'll tell you why. Uh, I have been in um, the area of nutrition and genetics for many, many years. And I was involved in um, the many conferences that actually uh, developed the scientific basis of recombinant DNA technology, which is really the technology that um, has expanded our concepts of genetics and genetic variation. It became very clear to me that if you are going to improve the health of the people, you need to understand where they come from. You need to understand their family history, what is special about them. And then 
most important, there is very good scientific evidence by using the techniques of molecular biology and genetics that there is genetic variation within the population, that the evolutionary aspects of diet are very important because the diet that we had during evolution is the diet that our genes actually know how to respond and how to express themselves. Um, therefore, I found it absolutely necessary, not only important, that we use the latest scientific information and apply it specifically to individuals, families, and groups that have genetic variants. And as we develop new foods, we should never forget the importance of the evolutionary aspects of diet. Yeah, that's really interesting because obviously it's built upon our, it's almost like a personalized diet, which is what this is about. So that's, and personal nutrition is a huge field that's important, so. Um, so, uh, so the whole purpose of the book then is to explain the science base, to point out that 72% of calories that we use today from our food supply were not present during evolution, that an awful lot of these new foods are not consistent with our genes, and these new foods are creating a lot of problems in terms of assimilating what we eat to, in our body to stay healthy. And if we were to give you a few examples, the most important one are the changes that have taken place in the food supply in fatty acids. For example, the, you know, there is people know about saturated fat and yeah. they know about cholesterol but they don't seem to know, although there is very good evidence and a lot of scientific research that points out that there are two families of essential fatty acids that are called omega-6 and omega-3. And these two families of fatty acids during evolution were balanced. In other words, when we ate fruits and vegetables, or meat or fish, we had a balanced amount of the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. And this balance is very important because the, these fatty acids are found in every single cell membrane in the body, in the brain, in the heart, in the cardiovascular system, everywhere. And so what happened is after the second world war, the the food industry moved ahead and developed a lot of oils out of seeds like corn oil, sunflower, safflower, cotton seed, soybean. All these oils were never part of our diet ever. And they're very high in the omega-6 fatty acids. The omega-6 fatty acids are pro-inflammatory. The two families of omega-6 and omega-3, they have opposing properties. So they have to be balanced. The omega-3s are found in green leafy vegetables and in fish. And depending on our genetics, some of us make more uh, of the longer chain fatty acids that are important for health than others. So that if you have a food supply, that all of a sudden is very high in omega-6 fatty acids from all the oils that are being used. And the meat comes from animals that they eat grains rather than actually um, grazing. You end up with meat that is very high in omega-6 with milk that is very high in omega-6, all the dairy products that is high in omega-6. And so this imbalance is detrimental to health. And that's why in the book and in the last chapter, we emphasize the importance of making dietary changes using 
your own way of cooking and recipes, but changing the oils so that you end up with equal amounts of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids, which is fundamental for health. And I should tell you that when I did my studies on the diet of Crete, which is the diet that is very similar to Paleolithic diet, and it's a diet that is balanced in omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids, we found out that the chickens, actually, they eat grass. They don't eat grains. But what happens here, we feed the chickens grains. The egg of a grain-fed chicken is very high in omega-6. It has a ratio of 20 to 1, where the egg from a chicken that grazes like it did throughout evolution, it has balanced omega-6 and omega-3. So we know and understand the importance of the balance. And that's why today we have eggs that are balanced in omega-6 and omega-3s. And that's why we recommend oils that such as olive oil, which is very low in, in omega-6, or we recommend a combination of olive oil and canola because canola is high in um, omega-3s. And so it's, it's not difficult to make the changes, changing the oils, getting grass-fed beef is very different from getting the standard grain-fed beef. Grass-fed beef has more omega-3s. And so you can make all these changes in terms of meat, in terms of oils, in terms of eggs, and then try to avoid frying foods because as you fry foods, you increase the oxidation and you're going to need more antioxidants. And these are actually the fundamental concepts that are important to make the changes to have a healthier food supply, which is consistent with evolution, which is consistent with our genetics. And people who have genetic variations, they can test for it and make the changes. That's very Does interesting. That question? Yeah, no, it definitely did. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's very interesting. The other thing I should emphasize is the fact that um, Western diets today um, are consistent in the majority, about 52% of foods are ultra processed foods. And ultra processed foods have been shown to be associated with obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. The interesting thing is that ultra processed foods were developed because of the technology, not because there was scientific evidence that we need to develop ultra processed foods. And ultra processed foods increase your appetite and you take in more calories and they are very extensive and beautiful studies. And particularly the study from NIH that very clearly um, shows that ultra processed foods versus foods that are not processed, the ultra processed foods, they lead to taking about 800 more calories per day because of the type of foods and the changes that have taken place in their molecules, they influence appetite, they increase appetite. And so it's very difficult to lose weight if you're eating foods, ultra processed foods that increase your appetite. It's very yeah. difficult to lose weight. You've got to make changes in what you eat and in the composition of the food, as well as the pattern, the overall pattern. And of course the diet of grits, which we describe in detail in the book is the healthiest diet. In order then to define the healthiest diet, you need to know for you, Okay, you need to know the family history. For example, if you have um, members of your, like your parents or your brothers and sisters, if they have cardiovascular disease, you certainly do, uh, don't want 
to eat a food supply that is based on ultra processed foods. You need to have more fruits and vegetables and green leafy vegetables and eating more fish and less meat and sourdough bread, which really um, makes you eat um, less. And so you have to know your family history. And in the book, we refer to how to get your family history by referring to the website of the Center for Disease Control in the US. That's one way to learn how to do it. Um, the other is that you can actually check um, your, your genetics. For example, you know there are people who have genetic variation and they cannot eat fava beans uh, because they develop hemolytic anemia. And, and so you know that you need to avoid, or there are people who cannot digest milk and it's due to a genetic variation. It's a lactase deficiency. And so you drink milk that has lactase in it, you know. Um, and so you need to have the family history, you need to understand the genetics, and then you ought to, to read the labels about the various foods. And I want to caution you um, when you read labels uh, because the, the standard label does not really give you all the information that you need to have. For example, if you were to look at beef that is grass fed and compare the composition of that beef to the composition of um, uh, meat that is made out of plant protein. Um, you know, the, these are the new foods that are getting into the market. So if you were to look at the, at the label, there isn't that much difference between the two. However, if you do detailed studies and you look at the molecular composition of the various peptides, there is a difference of about 90%. So grass-fed beef is not interchangeable with the hamburger you're going to buy at the store that is based on uh, uh, plant foods and plant proteins. And this is something that I want people to be very much aware because you can increase your plant food intake in your diet by eating salads, fruit, fresh vegetables, green leafy vegetables, and legumes. Legumes are high in protein. In fact, there are studies that show the more legumes you eat, the longer you live. And that's why in the cover of the book, you will see that legumes are recommended every day. And for example, you can have a chickpea, that chickpeas that you put in a salad with uh, watercress and, um, uh, and um, romaine lettuce or aragula. And you can make a salad with chickpeas or you can take chickpeas and turn it into an appetizer like hummus, or you can take chickpeas and make it into a soup, or you can make it into a stew. And so the same with lentils and the various beans and mung beans. You really ought to start with the real food you don't need to have the ultra processed food or imitation foods that I think are going are creating already a lot of problems. Thank you very much for this part one of the interview. Okay. It's been lovely talking with you.